So last week we covered um, area V1, and um, here we'll see. So we took looked at this. Now we'll we'll begin by looking at V2, V3, and you can see here we're looking at the medial side. So this is it's looking between the two brains. So this is a very Normally you have the, your corpus callosum here connecting the two brains. That's missing. So we're looking at the medial side. And we'll, what we'll do here is turn the, the head around. So you can see V1. And again, just a tiny side whoops, is, is showing. Okay. Just a little bit of V1 is showing when you're looking from the outside, the lateral side. But around it is V2, and around that is V3. If you look again on the inside, it looks V1, and then around that is V2, and around that is V3. Okay, so information goes to those areas. So let's um, blow it up and see what a line looks like when we look at a line. And again, this is the left side, so we expect to be activated by a line that rotates around the right visual field. And you can see that as the line rotates here, three lines appear. Um, and they're moving in strange patterns. It's hard to tell what, what this, this pattern is at the moment. So if we look at it in different spots, we'll see that, let's say this is slightly, this is almost horizontal, okay? But it's slightly below uh, the horizontal. So we see here, it appears in almost where the calc bottom of the calc line is, this dotted line, but slightly above it. But it's also appearing at the V2, V3 border. So th th it's, it's that pattern where, when it's horizontal. Let's look at a vertical line. So this is a vertical line. Again, that line that was just off horizontal has moved now to the V1, V2 border. That line, which was over here at the V3 border, has moved over now to the V1, V2 border. And this line has moved way to the edge. So they've moved in this strange pattern. And what, um, what's interesting about this pattern and is that the, these lines that you see here that the, this pattern forms when you show horizontal and vertical lines uh, allows you to tell where the borders are between the different regions. And when we do imaging studies of people, we can, in a healthy, normal individual, figure out where the borders are of, of your um, brain using fMRI and showing patterns like this on the eye. We can then be able to tell on each individual subject where these borders lie. Now, what, what, what is causing this odd pattern? Well, the key is this simple diagram. Imagine there's a line that starts here from the horizontal and goes to the vertical. So the, the, the tail of the arrow is here and the, the tip of the arrow is here. What happens when, when we see it over here? Well, we can see the tail starts at the horizontal. So that's where the horizontal is, at the bottom of the calcrine, and heads off to the edge. Okay. At the edge, then, that's where the, 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 the tip of the arrow is, we find another tip of the, another of the arrow that's in V2. And that's the mirror image of this. And we look at the V2, we find it at the edge over here, it's the tail. 
And if we move over to V3, it's again the tail. So V2 is the mirror image of V3. So V1 mirrors, V2 mirrors, and V3 mirrors. All these areas mirror one another. And this mirroring seems to be happening all over the cortex in almost every region. When we study the auditory system, we'll see that what's represented in the auditory cortex is the, the cochlea, the, the, the thing that you hear with. And that codes the frequency of the sound. And that, that cochlea then is represented um, mirror imaged in different areas of the auditory system. The hand is represented in the touch area and it's represented like this in one area and as, as its mirror image in the next area. So it looks like a, uh, an interesting principle that ties in a lot of your sensory modalities. And then, now why do you have this mirroring? What's the purpose? Well, one suggestion is that it's the following, that it, 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 it's caused by the folding action of your cortex. So you can see again, um, there's what we saw was the, 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 this arrow, and the, the tail is over here, the head is over here, then it mirrors at V2. This is V1, this is V2. And again, then the tail is represented way over here. Well, neurons over here want to project to neurons over here because both represent the tail. So um, whatever processes are processed about the tail here, you want to happen over here again. So you have got to send tail information to this part of V2. Well, the idea is that this connection, these axons that go across from one area to the next area, act like a spring, pulling these two folds together. And so it's, it is this, these connections between adjacent areas is what's, what's causing a lot of the folding action of your cortex. Now, what are these areas doing? Well, they're, they're, they're trying to figure out where object, what, ob, what objects you're seeing and what is background? So he wants to see what, what the foreground is, which is, from my point of view, all your faces. And, and then the background is the classroom. So I, my visual system is busy trying to segregate those two things. So imagine the simple, one simple thing is this, this um, square here that appears um, in this box. So one theory is the following, that... Initially, you have all these simple cells that are looking at the edges of this box. And all these simple cells are firing asynchronously, that is, at different times. When we just see a whole bunch of lines, so we first see the, th the box, it's a whole bunch of lines, and then the system assembles it into a box. And when it does so, the, 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 the cells that define the box start firing together. So A, B, and C define the corners of the box, D, um, but E is something else. E is part of the background. So it's firing at a different time. So it's this segregation, this grouping of activity. The ones that fire together um, belong to the same object. And the synchrony happens in the higher order areas as they gradually assemble the object, but then fed back to these lower areas. So when we record, when uh, somebody records from cell in V1, again, uh, when, when, when a, not, not a single object is seen, but by many uh, features, they fire asynchronously, but when the single object appears, they start firing together. Now, if you look at this, this is an example of the kind of assembly that the visual system has to do. 
uh, you gradually you can see here if you look at it you can see a face appear of something and gradually you can see a head a long neck to this object there's another face over here another long neck down here so your your, your visual cortex is trying to figure out which of these blobs belongs to the object and which belongs to the background. This is the problem the visual system is trying to address all the time. And when the, often um, the problem is made easier by cues. So if things are the same color, bang, the system assembles them into the same object. If they're moving together, the, 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 the features, it, it also triggers it to be the same object. And all the different cues that you can think of are useful in assembling this. Memory is another thing that's useful. You can imagine that you remember the, 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 the um, giraffe that you just saw, and you remember which parts belong to the neck and which ones belong to the background. Okay, here's an, another part of um, this assembly process. You can see that on these circles, there's a little quadrant being rotated, okay, a little bluish quadrant. If you look at the center here, you'll, but you'll see over here a line appear when all four things form a box. When they're turned a different way and no single box is formed, this line disappears. So now it appears, disappears, appears, disappears. Okay? So this is an illusionary co contour. The, the, the brain is making up this line from the, the ends of the lines. Okay, so there's, there's some cells in V2 that respond to real lines, but also to the ends of these lines, and some also in the one. You also might see a greenish tinge appear inside here. And that greenish tinge, again, is caused by the, the the cortex putting together, deciding this is an object. And from what I can tell over here, it is a bluish green object. And therefore, this inside must also be bluish green, in spite of the fact that I don't really see any color here. So it fills in from these edges. Um, the other thing that's very important in seeing is what we remember. So memories influence our seeing. So you have visual image, you have the visual cortex, you have our memories. Some sort of interpretation goes on here based on our memories, which then gets fed back to the visual cortex, um, driving up or driving down signals. Now, this word here, exact, if you look at this word quickly, you might not realize that this is an N and not an M. Okay. Um, because again, you expect from your memory of that word, that letter to be M. And uh, to prove the point, uh, if you, you can very easily read the sentence and all that's driving the system is that the first letter and the last letter are correct. The rest is often scrambled. And yet the brain, from based on your memories, can fill in the rest. Okay. What happens after that? Well, after that, the visual system separates. One part of it heads up top over here 
to the parietal lobe and the other part of it heads underneath to the inferior lobe. So again, this should get you oriented. There's a picture of one side of the brain and it's, this is the posterior back of the brain. This is the anterior front. This is the dorsal or top and this is the ventral or bottom. Now, over in these regions, and you have like many dozens of, of regions, um, 30 or 40 at the last count, I, I, I haven't kept up, but um, so you don't have just V1, V2, not just three lines, but of the order of 30 or 40 lines. Uh, so each, you have many areas, and each one is representing something special about those lines, okay? Some areas are, are coding their motion, some areas are coding their color, and a variety of other things that we do not yet know. So it's something like going to the, your multi-screen theater here at Silver City and uh, taking a, uh, uh, being there, and you've got all these screens going. And the, the main thing that's different of, of, of it is that uh, it's, it, all those screens are playing the same movie. Not quite the same movie, but different features of that same movie. Okay. And the really mind-boggling thing is our, so you look around the room now, and you can see all these objects and, and, and motion and whatnot. And all these things are coming from these dozens of screens. And you're aware of what's happening in all of them at the same time. There's no like little tiny person way back seeing all these screens and reassembling them into one. These dozens of screens is what you've got and what you work at. And your consciousness is based on your simultaneous uh, sense sense, perception of those screens. Yes? So, like, just to make clear what you said, there's no part of the brain that creates symbols. I think it's just, they're all firing at once. And we're all you have to, in order to be aware of all the aspects of what's going on in this room, you're, at, you're aware of what's happening on each of those screens. Okay, and there's, like, no separate part, like, okay, let's put it all together. No. Nope. Exactly. For a long time, we thought there might be, but there isn't. They're all just talking to each other, and you are aware of everything at the same time. Yes? And it's not like each, like one screen is responsible for color, and the other screen is responsible for more. The other screen is responsible for uh, like shape. Yes. All, all of them, together, like one screen signals shape, color, and, uh, and form at the same time. Is that right? Well, your early V1 is, but then it's, it's not divided into what uh, shape, color, or form belong to what yet. All you've got is a whole bunch of features. So it's really of little use in V1. You've got everything in V1, everything in V1, and everything in the eye, but not assembled into anything as yet. And once you start assembling them into objects or whatever, you still... Um, you know, not, not, you, 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 all the different aspects of that object are coded elsewhere. I'm just wondering, like, what's the difference between the, each screen, between each screen in terms of what each uh, process? Do we know? One, one, well, we don't know what all, all um, 36 or something do. We know that there are those many screens, what they each do, we don't know yet, but we know maybe a, what a dozen screens do now. And, for example, there's one screen that does color. So if you lose that, you lose all your ability to see in color. So there, there's, a, um, again, these, these two streams. Um, th this heading down here give, allows you, gives you this perception of edges and colors within objects. This one up here um, gives you um, this it has to do with, with spatial attributes 
and mostly things like the location of objects, their orientation, and their motion. <coughs> um, the dorsal stream, again the thing on top, is, is concerned with selecting actions for the different objects that, that are around you. So if you want to go kick a ball, you have to, you're, this, is, this is involved in seeing that ball, figuring out where it's heading, and you launching the appropriate movement to what, do whatever you want to do with this ball, to catch it, to kick it. So that's what's going on up here. And it's called the wear stream for that reason. You're concerned with where th things are. And the ventral, this bottom thing, um, and we'll talk about the, the dorsal stream, talking about a lecture or two. And this one is involved in the perception, recognition of objects. And it's called the what stream, what things are. And this is what we'll talk uh, more about now. So, again, our perception of objects begins in V1, and we're, we, in there we extract things like what if there's an edge, a line, what color it is. And it ends here in the inferior temple lobe. And there we have complex features being assembled into something like a face. Now, in V1, we have the, the top and bottom of a one part is, is above the calcarine and the other is below. But when we get to V2, V3, these tops and bottoms become separate. So what's in the upper, lower, upper visual field and lower visual field is still separate. The, the signal flows through all these regions and finally gets to an area here called the lateral occipital cortex. And that starts assembling um, object parts in, in um, together and but it hasn't assembled the whole object necessarily because it just worried about the the things that are on the ipsilateral side so on the same side as as the v1 v2 v3 it hasn't connected with the other side yet so again early visual field visual V1, V2, V3 are, are, have, V1 has like spokes and blobs that are involved in analyzing form and color. And then when we get to LOC, all these forms and blobs are assembled into objects. So this hippopotamus appears suddenly, or part of a hippopotamus appears suddenly. You can see that, that each of, in V1, you've got lines to uh, these, these pinwheels turn to particular orientation. And all, this column here is next to this column here is next to this column. And they all tune to that one orientation. And the activity of all these areas get combined or in an area like LOC. And then finally, that information goes to the inferior temporal cortex, and you recognize it as a particular object. So LOC is, is important for all objects. And if you don't have LOC, you can't recognize objects at all. Uh, if you're shown a, um, a can of Coke, um, you won't see it as a can of Coke. You can describe it as something shiny. Uh, you can say it's something red, but you won't be able to recognize the mechanical until, let's say, you feel it. Now, when I try to replicate the um, experiment of Ungerleiter and Hexby um, that looked at the activity in the, these dorsal and ventral streams. Uh, while subjects were sitting inside a magnet and doing an fMRI experiment, functional magnetic resonance imaging experiment. 
And they were asked two simple questions, and we're going to ask, pretend to ask you those two simple questions as well. <coughs> the first simple question is, keep your eye on this red dot, and you, if, you had, if you had access to a mouse, to click the mouse whenever the same face was repeated twice in a row. Okay, so you see a face, and then you see a next face, and both are the same face. Okay. Independent of where they're being shown. So you'll see the faces all over the place. But when they're the same face, you hit the table as hard as you can. Good. Okay. Now we'll switch the question. So I'm going to do, show you exactly the same thing, but the question will be different. So again, you keep your eye on this red dot. And when any face location is the same location as you just saw, okay? So now you're concentrating on it's in the same place not the same face, okay? Good. Okay, so when you do those two different questions, different parts of your cortex lit up right now as we did it, okay? If in the case of the same face, you're concentrating on the details of the face, trying to recognize the face. So this part of the, the ventral what field lights up. When your qu question is what location is the face, okay, this part lights up, the one that's going to, you know, do some action to, with respect to the face, turn towards the face, a variety of things. The other part is that if you have lesions, then you should have big differences as to what happens in each region. So indeed that's the case. So if you have a lesion here, you have difficulty pointing or grasping accurately. If I had this mouse, I'd have trouble reaching for it with accuracy. You have a lot of trouble catching a baseball. If you have a lesion here, again, you have a, a, an inability to uh, recognize particular objects. So before here, in LOC, you couldn't recognize any object. A face or a can of Coke, nothing. Over here, you're starting to get more detailed, okay? You're losing one thing or another thing. Um, and one, of, one example is this thing called prosopagnosia. So it's, a, again, a form of agnosia, but here you can't recognize faces. Selective for one thing. And it's kind of neat to see this tiny little area sitting here on the bottom of the face, of the brain, and it lights up when you show faces, and not scrambled versions of the same face. So it's not sensitive uh, on its own to the, to the eye, the nose, the hair, or the face. Okay? It has to be a particular face. And um, Nancy Kenwisher um, found that, that this activity appeared in an area called the fusiform face area, FFA. And we'll, we'll see it uh, in several other lectures that uh, we'll cover. And here we find um, clusters of neurons. And in these clusters, each of them <coughs> are selective to a particular face. And a similar sort of representation rep, 
uh, holds for different kinds of objects. So this FFA, losing it, causes prosopagnosia, and you can't recognize particular people. Okay? You can tell that that's a head, and that must be a face on top of the head, but who that is is beyond your, your capabilities. So you can imagine yourself going off uh, with your um, better half to Loblaws, or a friend to Loblaws, and you get separated, and you say, well, okay, we'll meet at the checkout counter. And you're standing there in the sea of faces, and you can't recognize the person you just left. Okay? It's a, imagine that's an odd feeling. You could be, there's a, 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 in, in the links, there's a link to a, a, a patient who had this experience with his wife, you know, he left and, and looks around and they see if he's blonde. Okay, there's lots of blonde ladies around, but which one's my wife? No idea. Okay, so in this uh, inferior temporal lobe um, that includes FFA, you have all kinds of cells and they respond to particular objects. Um, like this one here, it seems to like lions, but doesn't like giraffes or rhinos. The other interesting thing is that these objects can appear all over the visual field and light up that, that, that cell. Okay. It can be ipsilateral or contralateral uh, and still cause activity. Uh, so this is different from what we've seen up to now. Where we've seen V1 is only contralateral. Um, V2, V3 is the same thing. LOC is only contralateral. Okay. And this is the first place we've seen that now sees object from either visual field. Yes? Yes, there's an FFA on the opposite side as well. That sees the whole visual field. Um, there's a slight complication with FFA in that some of it on the left side has, we'll cover this later, has been taken over for reading. So it's, it's, it lights up for words. <laughs> but ba there's still FFA on the, on the other side that responds just the faces. Okay, it also doesn't matter what size that object is or what features denote that object. And here we get, get, denote the object by the lines that uh, um, define it, the color, the texture, or over here, the motion. You can see here, as soon as the thing stops, you lose, start losing your ability to see what, which, which of those lines belong to the object and which to the lion. When it's moving, it's easy to tell. They stop and the, the lion fades because the grouping starts to fade. The, the signal coming from the area that's defining motion fades and the lion fades. So, you can, it's an interesting to compare V1 and IT, how, how different they are. In, in something like uh, V1, this and this are somewhat similar. You can see a line back here, and there'll be a V1 cell in both these regions that light up. Okay. But uh, in, in, in you know, IT, th th this this will... Uh, one, one cell will light up for this, another cell will light up on this. If we compare this to this, again, in V1 now, very different cells will light up for this. So over here, it'll be just things over on this quadrant, and over here, it'll be 
cells over the whole visual field that will be lighting up. So very different V1 cells will light up, but the same cell in IT. The most striking thing is that, that how we can assemble all these pictures and recognize that they're different aspects of the same person. You immediately in 200 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds recognize each of these faces as belonging to the same person. And so you're, you're generalizing, you're, you're, uh, you're defining meaning from this face in spite of the very different activity. So cells in IT again start forming columns but within each column, um, it'll be either, like you can see here, a particular aspect of a face or a particular aspect of something that looks like a letter. So in one column, it'll be the face looking at you. Another column, it'll be a face turned a little to the side. In another column, it'll be a shape like a T, another column, so a, a, a shape like a Y. The interesting thing is that um, it's assembling things um, in, in a unique way. So when you, what's important to remember is that only your fovea sees clearly, okay? And so when you look at something like a face, at least from, a, uh, from close up, you're pointing your fovea to different features of that object. And then in your cortex, you somehow reassemble that object into that same face. So again, you put together the, this, all those features belong to this one face, and that face happens to be this beautiful little girl who is my daughter, or my daughter many, many, many years ago. The other interesting thing about the watch stream is that it distorts things. Okay? I'm going to, because see those two, those lines here. Um, I'm going to shorten the one that's in the foreground, and I want you to hit the table as hard as you can when you think the two are equal, the front, the one close up and the one far to the back are the same length. Okay, let's just examine them. A bit different still. Getting closer. About here, when they become roughly the same length, and this is this clearly looks shorter now. You know, it looks the one in the foreground looks shorter. Why is this happening? Well, it's because you know this window is actually that that it's it's rectangular in shape, okay, and that that this edge is exactly the same edge, same length as this edge. So here, the system is trying to um, describe, knows that the, this, this scene is made up of these objects, a window, and this window is really this shape. And so the length of lines becomes somewhat distorted. And if you're an artist, you have to take great pains to draw what is there and not what you see. It takes, you, you, that's what it takes practice in being an artist. When you draw this scene, get this the right length as this is not easy because of the distortion that your ventral stream produces in defining things as objects. 
Let's take a look at this face. Okay. You, you didn't see anything odd about it until it was upright. Okay. So that, that, that tells you something interesting about how a face, the picture of your face, is stored. You can imagine that somewhere in your memory you have an image of Mona Lisa. And it's not that. Okay? When it's upside down, you don't know. But when it, you look at it like this, you recognize it. It's not the one you had stored away in your memory. So, this suggests that in your memory, you store things in a sort of an object center or canonical form, a form that you most often see it. Okay? And then when you see an image a new image, you compare the features, let's say the, 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 the eye on this, to the, your memory of the eye of Mona Lisa. And doing this, to, comparing this to your memory is easy. And for some reason, doing this to your memory is hard. So somehow your brain um, has to rotate this eye and turn it upside down before it can tell whether it's the right shape or not. And not having done that very often, uh, it doesn't have, has, hasn't practiced it. So, in summary then, no oh, question. Yes. Somewhere in your in your temporal side of the brain, it will let up because there's a um, another part of the brain uh, that that lights up for body parts. So in the temporal lobe. It's still temporal. Yes. Yes. Not the not the uh, um, occipital uh, lateral occipital area. That's just object parts. The, any any objects not not that doesn't mean have to be body parts any part including a body part goes through there yes Right, it tries to compare that eye upside down to its memory of. The, that's right, the, the, the Mona Lisa's you had seen in the past are all right side up. And so your memory of it would be right side up, and it, it would take um, practice on the, on the part of the visual system to be able to compare an upside down eye to your right side up eye, memory of the right side up eye. Uh, I'm not sure what you meant. It's upside down when it's it's upside down when it's inverted. Right. It, this is with the view of the face that we had throughout our lives, and so we can tell that's that's wrong. But we can't tell the upside down what is wrong because it's not in the frame that we've seen it most often. It's another way to put it. Up. You had a question. Yes. Yeah, so if you had practiced up with 
upside down Mona Lisa. You could tell. The what? No, no, it 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 actually goes back all the way to V one. So it influences even what V we V one cells do. Our memories do that. Yeah, yeah. They they with fMRI now they've discovered all kinds of amazing things. Okay, so let's just so we've got uh, an action wear stream uh, that's involved in spatial relationships. And largely we're unconscious of it, you know. So I can touch, grab my mouse without, you know, thinking about it. It's an automatic action. So there's no consciousness involved. Whereas this what stream, it's involved in recognition and perception. So that's all conscious stuff. So it's the one thing that differentiates, it differentiates these two regions. Um, so the what stream gets its input primarily from the fovea. Um, while this one here, the action wear stream, gets it mainly from these large ganglion cells that we saw on the peripheral retina. It is by knowing that there's an object coming at you from the side that you react to it. Now, in the next lecture, we'll see that, or lecture five, we'll see that the two sides aren't equal. That uh, this side here specializes in language and recognition of words and sentences, and this side over here um, mo more involved in the sp spatially organized features, like the features that define a face. And this might explain why um, sometimes the different difficult to associate a face faces faces features with the name of the face which is stored on this opposite side okay <laughs>